northern Japan, March the 11th, 2011. Kindergarten teacher Eriko Horiyuchi is in class. The room begins to shake. The tremors were enormous and went on for ages. Stuff had been thrown all over the room. I really thought the building might cave in on me. She has to act quickly but calmly. I ducked under the desk along with the children and just monitored the situation. The earthquake continues for five minutes. It's felt 230 kilometers away in Tokyo. Eriko's actions ensure the children are safe. The kids had all done the disaster drills and they did what the teachers told them to do, and so it all went to plan on the day. Skyscrapers shake, and buildings collapse. The Japanese Meteorological Agency measures the quake at magnitude 9.0. It's the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in Japan. Even though the epicenter is 130 kilometers out to sea, the first news pictures show widespread devastation throughout the north of the country. In central Tokyo, communications expert Kenichi Shimomura hurries to the Prime Minister's underground crisis center. The quake is so big, it's clear there's going to be a serious humanitarian disaster. The government hastily convenes an emergency meeting. Because of the enormity of the disaster, my instinct was that the central government had to take its own initiative to act rather than waiting for local governments. Five of Japan's nuclear plants are in the disaster zone. Fukushima is the largest, providing enough energy to power every home in Tokyo. The Prime Minister's team has no direct link to the power plants. All information from the plant operator, TEPCO, filters through the government's nuclear regulator, run by Yoshinori Moriyama. Right after the earthquake, we received news from the Fukushima nuclear plant that Maine's power was lost. Fukushima is just 178 kilometers from the epicenter of the earthquake. At the first sign of tremors, the plant goes into scram mode. A controlled shutdown is underway. The power station appears to have suffered only minor damage. But the earthquake has destroyed key power lines which feed the plant. Emergency power sources kick in so the plant can continue to shut down safely. Two fifty-five p.m. A tsunami warning is broadcast to the nation. All of the northern Pacific Ocean is now on alert, including the Fukushima power station. At Teacher Eriko's school, all the pupils have survived the earthquake unscathed. Emergency plans call for everyone to evacuate. She packs the children into buses to take them down the hill from the school to their homes 
on the coast. She has not heard the tsunami warning. At Fukushima, the workers are also evacuated. A core team, the Fukushima 50, remain behind to ride out the tsunami. All along the Japanese coast, live news cameras relay images of the tsunami racing towards land. Fukushima power station bears the full force of the tsunami. The site begins to flood. Almost all power is lost. Two workers assessing damage in the basements are killed instantly. Control rooms plunge into darkness. The Fukushima 50 can't monitor pressure or temperature. Worse, the cooling systems have failed. Teacher Eriko is worried. She may have sent the children to their deaths. The bus route was along the coastline, so I was worried sick that it might have been washed away by the tsunami. The Tokyo Crisis Center. Prime Minister Naoto Kan arrives to learn that the Fukushima plant has lost all power. Nuclear experts are drafted in to brief the Prime Minister. Even those experts couldn't decide what should be done because this was totally beyond what they could have predicted. Plant managers are desperate to cool their nuclear reactors. They need power. We needed to deploy mobile generators. That was our last resort. Roads around the power station are severely damaged. Transporting the generators is almost impossible. In the damaged control room of reactor number one, Engineers are trying to find out what's happening inside the reactor. They resort to using battery packs and car batteries to power up instruments to take key readings. The radiation levels are beginning to rise. The Fukushima 50 don radiation suits and respirators to protect themselves. Their instruments reveal that pressure is rising inside the reactor. They must find a way to bring the pressure down. The news is relayed to the Prime Minister. He declares an official state of nuclear emergency. I heard the PM repeatedly say, almost to himself, this is really serious. Decisive action is needed, but there is very little information to work from. 
They have no real-time readings and no direct communications with managers at the power plant. Even so, scientific advisors believe they have a solution to avoid the buildup of pressure inside the reactors. Pressure inside the containment vessel must be kept low at all times. To release pressure, there's a valve. If you open it, pressure can be released outside. The Prime Minister's advisors recommend the valves are opened to release steam. At the plant, senior managers oppose the plan. They fear if steam is vented, radioactive materials could escape into the atmosphere. But under orders, the Fukushima 50 try to locate the safety valves. With only torches to guide them, finding the valves is no easy task. And handheld Geiger counters reveal radiation levels are rising. It might be because the reactor itself cracked during the earthquake. The Prime Minister receives more bad news. Mobile generators have made it to the plant, but that's not enough. The tsunami had thrown debris all over the site. So the mobile generators had problems driving into the power station and had trouble reaching the reactor buildings. Cables to the reactors are too short. The plant is still without power. Eight kilometers from the Fukushima plant, Eriko Horiuchi and her husband are getting anxious. There were rumors about radiation leaking and that the power station was in trouble. From then on, I started to feel uneasy. Local officials will not confirm the reports. Eriko's Swiss husband, Dominique, uncovers information through international news agencies. I still had contact to the internet, and I started reading foreign papers, and they were a little bit more explicit about the disaster. Then my wife told me that somebody was whispering about a problem at the power plant, and then we decided to leave early in the morning. The roads were cracked, so we didn't know how we could get out. We decided to wait until 5 a.m. to leave. Navigating damaged roads in the dark would be too dangerous. Eriko and her family choose to wait until dawn. At the Fukushima plant, pressure inside reactor number one has now risen so high, the workers fear the reactor could explode but they still haven't managed to locate key pressure release valves. Saturday, March the 12th. At their home, eight kilometers from the Fukushima nuclear plant, Eriko and her husband evacuate. We decided to get as far as possible from the power plant. We left at 5 a.m., and at 6 a.m. there was a general announcement ordering people to evacuate. Just one hour after they leave, massive traffic jams block the roads. Tens of thousands of residents are heading for evacuation centers as fear of radiation spreads. Frustrated by poor communication with the power station, Prime Minister Khan decides to visit the plant in person. We flew for miles and miles, and the scenery was the same as far as the eye could see.
The land was covered with seawater. We couldn't tell where land ended and where the sea began. Once at the plant, the Prime Minister demands a meeting with managers. He wants to know why reactor pressure release valves have not been opened. They said the valves would be opened within four hours or so. Then the PM said to him, you've been saying the same thing since yesterday, but it hasn't happened. Why is that? Finding the correct valves in the dark with soaring radiation levels is highly dangerous. One worker has already been taken to hospital, suffering from high exposure to radiation. And when they do find the valves, the loss of power makes them extremely hard to open. They are usually operated by heavy machinery running off mains power. The Fukushima 50 must try to do the job with car batteries and brute strength. The valves were opened, and as a result, pressure inside the reactor decreased. Plant managers now believe that reactor number one will be safe until they can connect mains power and begin cooling again. But radiation levels on the site are rising. Engineers hope it's because they've just released radioactive steam while opening the valves. But it may indicate that the 15 centimeter thick steel reactor is cracked and that a core meltdown has caused fuel to escape from the reactor itself. The danger is far from over. 3.36 p.m. A massive aftershock rocks the plant. The power station reported that they felt a huge tremor. Almost immediately, the building which houses reactor number one explodes. A cloud of white smoke was seen, and radiation levels increased dramatically. Workers detect radiation levels 1,000 times higher than usual, near reactor number one. It could be another sign that the reactor itself is damaged and leaking. And other reactors are also showing signs of strain. We realized there was damage to other reactor units. The first, second, and third units were all in serious conditions. Two days later. An even larger explosion blows the building that houses reactor number three apart. The explosion is exactly what the prime minister feared. I had a feeling of despair. The prime minister raised his voice at the experts and said, you all assured me an explosion was not going to happen. Why did it happen? He fears a catastrophic dispersal of radiation, a fear shared by the rest of the world as they follow events live on television. Within hours, radiation levels at the plant begin to climb even higher. The Fukushima 50 still have no control over the reactors. Prime Minister Khan is forced to face some hard truths in a live television broadcast. One hundred and eighty thousand people are now forced to seek temporary shelter far from their homes with no idea of when they may be allowed to return.
Erico is now 80 kilometers from the power plant. But such is her fear, she wants to get even further away. We decided to go abroad, but there were no seats left on any flights. We thought we'd try and go as far as possible from Fukushima airport, but there were no flights available anywhere. Eriko and her family are forced to stay where they are and take their chances with the radiation. And the very next day, another explosion causes a huge fire in reactor building four. After the first explosion, we tried our best to avoid the other two. But unfortunately, we could do nothing to stop them. That is a fact. When the fire dies down, steam seen rising from building number four suggests spent fuel rods in open cooling pools may have overheated, leading to yet more radiation leakage. Or full catastrophe, meltdown. Plant managers need to flood the rods with water to cool them. Chinook helicopters are drafted in to dump water from the air. They use seawater, which will corrode machinery and disable the reactors forever. But high winds make it impossible to direct the water efficiently. And radiation levels above the site are so high, the efforts must be abandoned. Only the fire department is capable of flooding the fuel rods with enough water to make a difference. Ichiro Suzu is diverted from tsunami relief duties to lead an elite team of firefighters. When I arrived in Fukushima, I felt that I wanted to live up to the expectations of the country. At the entrance, it was eerily silent. The inside of the Fukushima power plant really did resemble something from a monster movie. Suzu and his team brave the dangers and spend days spraying water onto the spent fuel pools on site. He wears two radiation suits to protect him from fallout. I was wearing these protective suits for seven hours and it was excruciatingly hot. So hot that the sweat was dripping out of the filter in the breathing mask onto the ground. It was hell. I couldn't drink any water or go to the toilet. It was incredibly stressful. While Ichiro Suzu and his team struggle to maintain control of Fukushima, the water they spray onto the plant is washing radiation into the ocean. And 230 kilometers away in Tokyo, reports begin to emerge that supplies of drinking water may be affected. The Prime Minister must now consider increasing the evacuation zone to 250 kilometers. It would mean ordering 30 million people, including the whole of Tokyo, to abandon their homes. This would be an unprecedented decision, one that no government has made in modern history. It takes more than two weeks to restore power to the plant. But it's far too late to stop the disaster, and radiation continues to leak from the reactors. Japan and the world are desperate to know what is happening inside the plant. And what went so disastrously wrong at Fukushima? Within days of the tsunami, 
official investigations are already underway. The Japanese government invites the UN's nuclear energy watchdog to visit Japan. They work with Japan's energy experts to gather information about how to deal with the continuing crisis at Fukushima and how to make sure it never happens again. Leading the team of international experts is nuclear physicist Dr. Mike Waitman. When you first go onto the site, it looks a well-looked-after site. And then you stop and look at the reactor buildings and you don't get that sort of uh, sense of the utter devastation that occurred across the site just by looking at the pictures. Three of the six reactors at Fukushima are now beyond repair. But like all nuclear plants, Fukushima was designed with safety at its core. The threat of accidents like Three Mile Island and Chernobyl are ever present. And in Japan, earthquakes and tsunamis are a constant threat. At Fukushima, seawalls protect the plant from tsunami waves. And reactors are dug deep into hard rock to protect them from earthquake damage. As a fail-safe, emergency generators are ready to keep the site running if power should be cut. But none of these safety measures were enough to protect Fukushima. Now, by rewinding the events of that day and digging deep into the investigations that followed, we can reveal how, with all their preparation for just this kind of incident, this disaster could have happened. Mike Waitman examines Fukushima's defenses to understand what went so catastrophically wrong. He finds some crucial flaws in the original design of the plant. He suspects that designers were more concerned with the threat of an earthquake than the dangers posed by a tsunami. When reactors 1 to 4 were laid out in the 1960s, engineers lowered the land on which the site was built by 25 meters. This allowed them to anchor reactor buildings into the bedrock beneath the plant. would prevent them from collapsing during an earthquake. But it left the site vulnerable to tsunamis. To protect against the threat, sea walls were built surrounding the site. They would repel waves up to almost six meters high. But evidence shows the tsunami waves wash over these walls with ease. Given that the inundation from the tsunami, in this case, reached 14, 15 meters and spread right around the reactor buildings, right across the site, that was far below what was uh, needed to protect against such a tsunami. A worker records the moment of impact on video. Another takes photographs as water floods the plant in a succession of waves. The tsunami walls were too low. This simple design flaw led to a catastrophic series of events that would leave the plant in danger of meltdown. During the earthquake, power is lost. The most powerful quake in Japanese history brings down Maine's power lines. At the point of the earthquake, the reactors shut down their operations automatically. That's what they do. Following standard procedure, emergency generators kick into action. All nuclear power stations have backup power systems on this side with six reactors, they had 13 diesel generators, and they operated as they're supposed to do. But then the tsunami hits. As thousands of tons of water wash over the site, most of the diesel generators are flooded. 
The diesel generators were located in the bottom of the turbine buildings and other lower level areas of the site, and that made them vulnerable to widespread flooding. Flood protection doors are no match for the tsunami. All power is lost. Engineers cannot control the amount of heat generated in their huge reactor pressure vessels. First thing to notice is the reactor pressure vessel, it, it, it's a, a large structure. It's about the size of a, a double-decker London bus. But within that, it's really acting like a kettle. Deep inside the reactor, nuclear reactions create heat to produce steam, which then drives turbines. When the power cuts out, water, which prevents the system from overheating, stops flowing. But the nuclear reactions continue, and so the fuel still pumps out heat. Cooling is fundamental to ensuring the safety of nuclear reactions. But you have to keep on cooling that reactor down in order to keep it safe. Plant managers have no power to keep cooling pumps going. Fuel rods begin to overheat, turning to liquid. This meltdown releases large amounts of radioactivity. And temperature and pressure gauges across the plant are out of action, so managers have no knowledge of the state of their reactors. They must improvise an emergency response. Even when we were there 10 weeks later, the number of cars that were just strewn around, around the site was quite uh, enormous. What they were doing is they're trying to take car batteries and then using that to power up instruments to see whether they get any readings from what was happening in the reactors. Using car batteries gives engineers momentary snapshots of the state of their reactors. How do you know how much water is in the reactor? Where is it? What are the flow rates around the systems? They tried what they could to try and get readings from them. With these batteries, the Fukushima 50 are able to take important readings. They could also open safety valves. But these readings offer only brief glimpses of reactors heating dangerously and approaching meltdown. Without power to run their cooling systems, there is nothing they can do to stop it. And worse, because of the design of the plant, it leads to yet another problem they can't stop. Waitman believes that the outdated design of the reactors themselves led directly to the three explosions on site. Tons of nuclear fuel are housed in fuel rods and usually kept cool by a flow of cooling water. Coating the rods is a thin layer of a rare metal, zirconium, that protects the rods from excessive heat yet allows the nuclear reactions to continue. But when the temperature rises, zirconium becomes highly reactive. Because you've got a lot of the zirconium in the core, and if it all gets overheated, uh, then it can react uh, aggressively with the steam and the water to create hydrogen. Estimates show that temperatures reach as high as 2,800 degrees Celsius inside the reactor, easily high enough to trigger the reaction between zirconium and steam. As highly flammable hydrogen builds up dangerously, managers vent it out into the concrete shell surrounding the reactor. Radioactive material from the fuel rods also escapes. From there, it's slowly vented outside through safety valves. But not all the hydrogen makes it into the open air. Large amounts escape into the higher reaches of the building. The Fukushima 50 cannot stop the gas from igniting. There would be broken equipment there. It only needs a small amount of energy uh, to be able to spark it. The hydrogen buildup causes two massive explosions in reactors one and three and a devastating fire in unit four. It causes shock waves around the world. 
Japan's nuclear crisis is now officially on the same level as the Chernobyl upgrade, the severity of the I nuclear think instead, to voices from abroad, to nuclear experts in Europe who think the Japanese may have lost control. Comparisons drawn to the Chernobyl nuclear explosion. Far more serious than they first told the rest of the world. Panic about the extent of radiation spreads as comparisons with Chernobyl bring back memories of radioactive fallout on a global scale. At Chernobyl, eight tons of nuclear fuel were thrown up into the Earth's atmosphere when the reactor was blown apart. Mike Waitman reassesses the extent of radiation released at Fukushima to see how it compares to the Chernobyl incident. People have looked at the comparison between Fukushima Daiichi and at Chernobyl. In fact, it was a tenth of the amount of radiation that was released, so it wouldn't have spread as far. Waitman knows Fukushima had the potential to be much worse, perhaps as bad as Chernobyl. If hydrogen had remained inside the reactors, pressure would have become so great that an explosion could have blown over not just the reactor containment buildings, but the reactors themselves. Reactor 3 contained 88 tons of both plutonium and uranium fuel, which could have been exposed and dispersed. Exactly what happened at Chernobyl in 1986. When managers followed the Prime Minister's order to release steam and reduce pressure within the reactors, this disaster was averted. Waitman concludes that engineers made the right decisions on site to avoid further catastrophe. Two weeks after the tsunami, power was restored to the site and the temperature inside the reactors was brought down gradually. But melted fuel still remains and it continues to release radiation. Only robots can get near the reactors now. It could be a decade before investigators can look into the reactors safely and analyze precisely how core meltdown led to such a substantial release of radiation. Knowing how the defenses failed and led to a catastrophic chain of consequences, Mike Waitman now examines whether the power company which runs the plant, TEPCO, could have done anything to avoid the disaster. He believes they may have been negligent in the run-up to the tsunami. In 2002, TEPCO took part in a study into the impact of tsunamis on power plants. They concluded there was a 0% chance that an earthquake large enough to cause a damaging tsunami would affect the Fukushima plant in the next 30 years. They were wrong. They didn't address tsunami hazards sufficiently well. You must not underestimate rare natural events, and you must take those into account in your design. TEPCO say they had taken appropriate safety measures, taking account of all known information. But they say the scale of the tsunami was beyond anything they could have foreseen, and that since the incident, they've done everything possible to stabilize their reactors. After the disaster, the fallout from how it was handled spreads far and wide. Residents like Erico believe they were told too little too late about the potential dangers caused by the explosions. They blame both the power company TEPCO and the government. There was absolutely no information about radiation. The only information we were getting was about expanding the evacuation zone. The government itself struggled to ensure the release of information. The Prime Minister was personally committed to being open, but he was dependent on his advisers. Immediately after the incident, the PM asked the experts, what do you think is going to happen to Fukushima next? None of the experts could give clear answers. The only thing they confidently said was, 
a hydrogen explosion is not going to happen due to its design. We thought, if we cannot believe what they say, what can we really believe? The Prime Minister's experts had few details at their disposal because so little information was coming from TEPCO. What did the people in close connection with the Fukushima nuclear plant, such as TEPCO, really know? And did they share all their knowledge with the government? Prime Minister Naoto Khan was caught up in events beyond his control. Five months after the tsunami, he was forced to resign. With no end to the Fukushima disaster in sight. At the plant, the reactors are being brought into cold shutdown. But they continue to be dangerously radioactive. Clearly, the incident is still not under full control. And it may take some years before you get full access. Despite that, we know enough to move forward as a world community to learn lessons from Fukushima. Some nations have decided there is only one lesson to learn. In May 2011, two months after the disaster, Germany decided to halt its nuclear power program and focus its finances on research into renewable energy sources. Switzerland and Italy have followed suit. Japan relies on nuclear power for 30% of its energy use. With no power being generated at Fukushima, Tokyo is experiencing regular power shortages. The new Prime Minister is committed to continuing the country's nuclear program. At Fukushima, the workers who stay to wrestle control of the plant and firemen like Ichiro Suzu, the true heroes of this event, have been given the all clear from medics. But again, it may take some years before the full consequences are known. Teacher Eriko never made it further than the airport. She's now living in a flat with her family, some 80 kilometers from the plant. The bus her kindergarten class traveled home in missed the tsunami. All the children survived. In the area around Fukushima, the disaster's effects will remain for many years to come. An exclusion zone 20 kilometers around the plant is still being enforced. All farms are abandoned. Four centimeters of radioactive topsoil must be removed from every plot of fertile land. Until then, no crops can be grown again. It could be 10 years before 100,000 people in evacuation centers across the region will be allowed to return to their homes.